All right. That was the longest Illinois basketball season in a long time. And that's a good thing. That's a good thing because they were in this thing for a long time. Not a great end, but it's time to catch up with Michael Tulip. We will preview the offseason, which is already underway, including the addition of Jake Davis, the departure of Dane Danger. But Mike, we got to bring up the end. Uh, what a season it was. We'll talk about that. But uh, just a 30 to nothing run, unprecedented, un unlike anything I've seen. Uh, UConn headed to the Final Four with a, a huge route of the Illini. What went wrong in that final game for Illinois? Yeah, I mean, the end of the season is always fascinating because, especially in that tournament, it's you get 68 teams that come in and 67 lose. Yep. So you're either getting your ass kicked <laughs> to end your season or you're close enough to where there's like a what could have been or um, heartbreak. So, I mean, there's heartbreak in this one too, for sure. But um, we'll get into the season, obviously, in, in totality, but – the second half and the 30 0 run specifically, I mean, I thought things were a little bit tenuous in the first half mm -hmm. just because there was really only one way that you were generating offense with Marcus Damask. And a lot of that was when Donovan Klingon wasn't on the floor. Right. So the ineffectiveness when he was out there made for just a very, very important first few minutes of that second half. Um, I think everybody could kind of feel that. And yeah, they ran you out of the gym. And and part of that was we talked about like the ineffectiveness offensively. Part of that was was obviously cling. And I thought, I, I'm not kidding. I've never seen anything like that, man. Like I haven't seen that. I haven't seen that since Anthony Davis in 2012. Mm -hmm. Really? Like it's been it's been that long since I've seen someone defensively disrupt a game like that. And it's not just the block shots, it's the paranoia. It's I thought what it did psychologically for Illinois. Um, Terrence you know, in particular, I thought. Say that again? Terrence in particular, I thought. Yeah. I mean, I mean, when you have Klingon, and this is why, like, when you go back and watch when Creighton beat them by 16, they were UConn was up 11 to 4 and jumped on Creighton, and then Klingon got two fouls. And then Creighton got right back in the game. But when Klingon came back in late in the first half and even in the second half, what Creighton had, we talked about Trey Alexander having like those back downs that even before the game, I'm like, Marcus Damas is going to have that. Like he's going to have those opportunities. But Stephen Ashworth, Schreierman, Alexander, all those guys are good shooting off a of movement, off the dribble. And that's not that was not one of the strengths of this Illini team. It just wasn't. And that was really where you were going to have to get the bulk of your work offensively. Floaters, mid-range. Um, all those shots that you kind of want to force on on your end defensively because challenging Klingon at the rim over and over again. And even in that 30-0 run, there was a stretch where, and this is nothing against Quincy Garrier or Dre Gibbs Lawhorn, but if you're UConn, you're sitting there you're saying, okay, it's not Taryn Shannon, it's not Marcus Damas taking these shots. It's those guys. And, you know, Coleman Hawkins took a few threes, and those threes were barely getting over the front of the rim. Those things lead to basically outlet passes because they don't get any air on them. And we talked about the stays and transition before the game. That showed itself because there were plenty of times where guys didn't crash and they didn't sprint back, and UConn just ran right past them, and they were able to, to outlet it. Like, UConn didn't need – in that 30-0 run, they didn't need to run a ton of half-court offense. No. So, you know, you miss shots. Like, it's it's somewhat that simple, too. I mean, you took, you took like, 11 threes in that 30-0 run. You made none of them. And some of them were some of them were decent looks. Some of them some of them weren't decent looks. But all of that baked together. Whenever you get a 30-0 run, there are dramatic pulls on both ends. You got to have UConn playing really well and making shots and making you pay for for the stuff that you do. And you got to have Illinois playing very bad. And they were very bad. I mean, I thought they were like to put it bluntly, like they were shell shocked. Yeah, they were. And and that the ripple effect that that had psychologically i mean baseline out of bounds passes were getting picked off for runouts twice in that run um you know some guys taking uncharacteristic shots some guys driving when they should have shot shooting when they should have drove like it, it was it was all of that and and you bake all that together and that's that's what you end up getting i thought trying to get cling in foul trouble was a really good strategy early right yeah. because when he was out it, it made all the difference. Like Illinois was, was cooking offensively with Domask and that booty ball when he was out. But about 
13, 14 minutes into the first half, Mike, there needed to be a change. And it just felt like Illinois didn't adjust. Whether the coaching staff said it, you know, Brad, I know during the timeout and TV said, we're going to keep going at him. We're going to keep going at him. Um, at that point, you, the players had to know too, like we, we got to take open jump shots. And, and as you said, they're, they're passing them up to go attack Klingon, which made no sense. Yeah. And, and I think I, I talked about it during the game because I didn't, I didn't mind attacking Klingon. It's just the way in which you attack him. When you when you force him to have verticality and contest at the rim, he's really hard to draw fouls on. He just is. Like he's just he's so good at that. Just like Kalkbrenner, um, Edie's good at that too. Like they're all good at, at showing their hands and showing verticality. And you know, the way that you were gonna get him, in my opinion, and much easier said than done, by the way, because you got a really good coach on the other side too, in Hurley, where he was gonna try to make sure that to keep Klingon out of foul trouble, right? Depending on who he was going to put on him. Because if Quincy Gary was on the floor, Klingon was guarding Gary, even if Ty Rogers was out of the game. So, you know, like I, I think they didn't feel like Quincy, a guy that plays primarily off of one foot, was going to get Klingon in foul trouble. And he's not lightning quick off the bounce. So you don't worry about him getting Klingon in space and picking up that second foul. Because to me, that's where his second foul would have come from was in transition in space to where he's out of position. Like fouls come from being out of position most times. And you needed to get Klingon out of position. You weren't, I just don't think you were going to draw a foul, even though you got your first one at 1657 on him. It's just getting another one off of, you know, challenging him at the rim is just a fool's errand in a way. And and it's hard because you want to, you want to train your team to kind of be fearless in a way. And you don't want to deter them from, or make them feel like they can't drive inside because there's a paranoia that Klingon creates as well. Um, but, you know, when Dre gives Lawhorn drives baseline and challenges him, I think that was the first time for Terrence as well that he felt like somebody could really match him at the rim. And Terrence, Quincy, I mean, you have a lot of guys that play off of one foot mm -hmm. around the rim most times. And what's funny is it was 30-23 after Klingon got the layup to start off the second half. And Ty Rogers makes a great pass to Terrence. Terrence goes, you know, floater from 14 feet. It was a great shot. Bounced and kind of sat on the rim. Ty Rogers runs in, tips it, bounces, sits on the rim, falls off. And like that is, I don't know. Like Terrence gets that floater to fall. Cause I was even in the first half, I'm like, I think Terrence just needs to see like a three go in. Yeah. Like he just needs to like the ice needs to break. And maybe that floater would have done it, would have stopped the 30 0 run. I don't know. Um, but a lot of that you just you, you credit UConn, you credit Donovan Klingon because I that that was you see now he's like projected top three. Just he was like top, he was lottery, and now he's top three after that game with some consideration for one. Yeah, um, that UConn team is is a machine. Like that is just a machine. Like I, even if they play well, I don't know if they beat UConn in that game, but it feels like it's going to be UConn Purdue. Uh, listen, Alabama can score with UConn. I think. Yeah. Um, they get shots yeah. off the bounce. Yeah, yeah. And they, my question is, can they stop UConn's offense? I don't, I don't know, because uh, Alabama's defense isn't very good. But uh, Purdue, UConn would be one heck of a matchup, Mike. They would. I and and I think this was the matchup back in December, yeah. right? January. Yeah, like, like Baylor Gonzaga that year, right? Yeah, like those two teams were always a cut above the rest. Even with even with Houston, like Houston had some deficiencies offensively. Um, Houston gives up a ton of offensive rebounds. Like there were, there were certain things that some holes in, in Houston where it was going to be tough for them to string five, six wins together in this tournament. But yeah, I mean, I I'm really fascinated to see it because you know, what's weird is with Zach Eady and that's a whole different, that's, that's a whole different topic. I, I can't stand that app right now. I mean, <laughs> if it's not Zach Eady and how he's, I'm not going to get into that, but this is an epic postseason for him. Epic. No, it is, man. Like it's historical. It is. It's any time. Like you can't poo-poo. Like, hey, first since you know Lou Alcindor. First since Shaq. First, I mean, first since David Robinson. Like, uh, like just that tall is, guys. Just tall guys. Yeah, it's 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 elite elite company. And um, you know, I, I hope these two can meet because I just feel like you know you got Braden Smith who can make shots off the bounce. You got Fletcher Lawyer who can make shots off the bounce. Uh, we know what Zach Eady brings to the table. How does he fare against a guy like Klingon? Because I think the way for for a guy like Zach Eady to be impactful against Klingon is you got to post him deep, and Eady's really good at posting guys deep. When you post him deep, you take away his range as a shot blocker. 
Um, cause he's not the strongest guy clinging. Like I think Edie's much stronger than him, has a better base, but you know, he's going to have to post deep and post early. And, and we got to see if this Purdue team can keep up with UConn defensively. Um, so I'll be down there. I'll be in Phoenix, That's awesome. uh, which was hoping Illinois got the win so I could kind of be around for that. But now it's like you got these UConn fans and Purdue fans walking around. And I see it every day at the gym, too, with uh, all the Purdue and Indiana fans. So uh, it should be it should be a great final four. You got DJ Burns. You got Mark Sears. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of cool star power yeah. down there in Phoenix. Uh, Steven Castle, if he guards Braden Smith, good luck, Braden. Uh, that kid, that kid really impressed me the other day. Um, all right, Mike, let's wrap up the season. What was most memorable about this season? Obviously the first elite eight in 19 years, big 10 tournament championship, 29 wins, third most all time. What will you remember most? I think just the maturity. Um, you know, and I say that, I know we talked about just a team that got kind of shell shocked and, you know, had some uncharacteristic things happen in that UConn game. But overall, the maturity they showed throughout the season, through the ups and downs, tearing suspension out of the lineup, you hold down the four, you bring him back, he's reacclimated, he has the stretch that he has. Uh, and then just how enjoyable I thought they made winning look, right? That was definitely on display during the NCAA tournament, during the Big Ten tournament. And um, and then just the, the last point I'll make is the buy-in. Because none of this happens without the buy-in, particularly, and I'll, I'll kind of go down the line here, fifth-year guys, grad transfers, it's, you have to buy in quick because mm -hmm. you're only there for a short amount of time. And the buy-in from Damask and Gary A and Harmon was a big reason why you were able to accomplish what you accomplished this year. Because guys that are stubborn, guys that want things a certain way, you slow down that process, and before you know it, you're 500 in conference play, and you're barely getting into the tournament, and then your season's over. That's happened for a lot of teams. And, and then the buy-in for guys like Dre Gibbs Lawhorn and Dane Danger. Because both those guys, there's no way those are the roles they expected coming into the season. And I know it was hard. Like, you could tell – I could tell midseason it was hard on Dre Gibbs Lawhorn. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, he's buying in, particularly on the defensive end. Dane Danger buying in, particularly on the defensive end. And then you kind of have your moments. Dre has his and Moorhead's the Moorhead State game. He had, he had a good showing against Ohio State, Wisconsin. Like, and, and he's ready when the moment happens. And I think a lot of that comes from the upperclassmen because Terrence Shannon's the last guy I'll mention, where you know, you have a guy in Marcus Damask who comes in and you formulate a lot of this offense around Marcus Damask. Let's be honest. Like booty ball was Marcus Damask. And Terrence had no issues with it. And I talked about that before and after the Big Ten Championship. And I thought the maturity from Terrence, the maturity from all these guys and the buy-in was, was a huge reason you had a successful season. Eat stress-free this spring with Factors, delicious ready-to-eat meals. Every fresh, never-frozen meal is chef-crafted, dietitian-approved, and ready to eat in just two minutes. Choose from a weekly menu of 35 options, including popular options like Calorie Smart, Keto, My Favorite Protein Plus, or Vegan and Veggie. Also, discover more than 60 add-ons every week, like breakfast, on-the-go lunch, snacks, and beverages to help you stay fueled and feel good all day long. So what are you waiting for? Get started today and fuel up your springtime goals. With Factor, you get chef-prepared meals on the table in two minutes with Factor's ready-to-eat meals, so you can get back to doing what you love this spring. If you're looking for gourmet meals, try meals that feature premium ingredients like filet mignon, shrimp, truffle butter, broccolini, and asparagus. These are no-fuss, no-mess meals. Factor meals eliminate the hassle of prepping, cooking, or cleaning up. Simply heat and savor the good stuff. So head to factormeals.com slash Illini50 and use code Illini50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box. That's code Illini50 at factormeals.com slash Illini50 to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next box while your subscription is active. What I find most fascinating is, you know, Dane probably knew he was leaving, Mike, as he entered the transfer portal and he still was ready. Like he, he still was ready. He didn't sulk. He didn't just quit on his team, but he does enter the, the transfer portal. I don't think you or I are shocked by this, but it, it's, what do you think of, of both sides of this? Cause Illinois could have probably told Dane, we're building around you. Here's your pie of NIL uh, from, from our pie here um, and said, Hey, you're, you're going to be a go-to guy, but they're obviously not going to do that with the way they've been playing. And, th and then Dane, 
uh, looking elsewhere. What do you think of both sides of that? Yeah, I think on the one hand, I think it's, it is it is best best for both sides. I think it was it was really cool seeing him come on late. Just I, I think about that Iowa game. Um, you know, I think about the Big Ten tournament, some of the performances he had in the NCAA tournament. It's it's interesting to think about the state of college basketball to, to sit here and say, man, he made a lot of money for himself in the last <laughs> month. And typically we talk about that through the, you know, the lens of your professional prospects, but that's the nature of college basketball now, right? I mean, when you look at the numbers, six and three, what that gets you on the open market is different than if you were really watching in that big 10 tournament and in the NCAA tournament, like that's, that's, that's a starting big man at a lot of different schools across the country. And, you know, there are just like in the corporate world, right? What's your biggest chance of getting a raise? It's by probably going and finding another job somewhere else. Like that is like, someone's likely going to pay you more than the place that you're at. Um, that happens all the time. And I think the same goes for, for Dane. And, and I, I certainly wish him the best. It was a joy watching him and watching his progression. And, and yeah, I mean, there's the way this offense has trended for Illinois and the way in which you're going to be able to pitch this offense in the off season doesn't necessarily lend itself to a guy like Dane Danger, whereas you know there's going to be some schools that want to throw the ball in to Dane 15 to 20 times a game. I mean, shoot, he could end up being an Indiana Hoosier, uh, right? Like you never know, and and so that's that's why it, it it's felt kind of amicable on both sides, um, you know, because the it felt kind of like written for yeah. For a while, I mean, I thought I'll be dead honest. I thought I thought he might have done it last year, yeah, right. But now, I guess, correct me if I'm wrong. He graduated, right, or he's graduating. It doesn't even matter anymore, right? Like that was that was a big deal. Like he might have had to sit out last year. Uh, yeah, for they, they did away with that, right? They did away with that. So yeah, yeah so just... yeah, so uh, I, I digress. No, I, I think it's he'll be a he'll. I think he'll be a 12, 13 plus point per game guy wherever he goes next, and. He's going to really help out a team, and he he had a lot of really solid contributions here at Illinois. He is a fan favorite, man. After that that postseason, he should be yeah. like that was an amazing postseason. They don't win a Big Ten championship, and they might not win their first round NCAA tournament game uh, without him. But this is kind of a obviously Illinois is going to add a big man in the portal. We'll get to that, Mike. But Illinois kind of passing the baton to Imani Hansberry and, and Marez Johnson here. So what's this mean for those guys? I don't know what it means because it's April third. And we still got to see how this roster shakes out. I think when you, when you look at a guy like Marez, just the way he plays his motor, like those guys in my, I can just say the same for Amani. motor motor about the right things. Those guys find a way to get on the court. They just do. And, um, you know, Amani's another guy I'd, I'd want to mention just from a buy-in standpoint, because I thought this is just me sitting on my couch 115 miles away, but I thought Amani did wonders for Dre Gibbs Allhorn this year because he had a freshman that was going through with him. And if you watch Amani, that dude was always positive. And if you're Dre, you're like, I'm going to stick out. If I, if, you know, if I'm kind of wallowing in this, I got to be more like Amani. And I said, I was at games where I saw Amani like grabbing Dre and like, that is insane for a freshman. Um, to experience what Amani experienced this year, probably his m- most limited amount of playing time for his career, and to and to to keep his head on straight. Um, you know, it sounds like he's got really great people around him as well. So those type of guys tend to figure it out, no matter what that looks like. So, like I said, April third, we'll see how this roster materializes. But um, there's there's definitely reason to be excited about those two. I'm a huge fan of Imani. Uh, I just I just think he translates well the way he plays. Uh, and, and to see his shots going in the NCAA tournament. Like he wasn't scared. Uh, I thought that was that was a lot of fun and talking to him after the game. He was uh, he's just always he's a mature kid. But the Illini start the offseason already by adding a transfer in Jake Davis, Mercer freshman, averaged nine points, four and a half rebounds. And he can shoot, Mike, 39% from three for a big body guy. What do you think of this addition? Well, going off of the departure of Dane Danger, very similar with Jake, is you have a guy that you can mold a little bit because he's young. I mean, Dane came in, looked at all the weight he shed, getting with Fletch. 
you don't have guys like we're used to with Damask and Gary and Harmon that are, you know, for the most part, finished products as it pertains to, you know, college basketball. They obviously got a lot out of Marcus this year with the way they used him. But to have a guy that is a freshman going to be a sophomore that you can kind of really get your hands on and, and, you know, have like these program guys that can build with the program. I mean, by all accounts, Jake's about the right things from everything that you hear. I, I was just, you know, even reading, I think it was your article, right? Where he's talking about, Hey, I need to get better one-on-one defensively. I got to get with Fletch. I got it. Like hearing those types of things is, is really encouraging. And And when you watch him, you know, there is like, he knows how to play. He's great. We've talked about his shooting 39% from three, but he's great off of movement. Uh, Mercer ran a lot of these, a lot of different actions, but these continuous staggers where, you know, you, you saw it with Terrence, right? He would come off a stagger, like a double stagger. Um, and then you'd have a guy in the opposite corner come under the basket and then off that same stagger all the way around. So, and, and he's shooting shots off of that. And that's really difficult. There's guys that can, make shots that have to still be square to the basket that come off the screen and can get their inside foot. When you're coming from around the basket underneath and then out, and you have to kind of do a whole pirouette to shoot like that, that takes balance. That takes confidence. And, and if you watch his shot too, we'll, we'll break it down in the film. There's no wasted motion, which is why I don't worry about him getting a shot off at this level because it's, it is here and it's up. It's not dip. It's not things that you worry about with guys that take a little while to, to get their shot off. And when there's no wasted motion, you give yourself a better chance to shoot better percentages too. So he has all that going for him. I think, you know, the last thing that I'll mention is defensively. Like I'm really curious to see how he grows in that area. And this is just kind of like a theory that I've workshopped over the years, but at the mid major level, it's almost like how I felt about Marcus Damask in a way where when I watched Damask, I'm like, I think he can, you know, I think he can hold up defensively. It's weird at the mid-major level, you have bigs and you have small guards. And then at the high major level, you have more wings. Yeah. And so it's like a guy like Jake Davis, who when you watch, it's like wasn't the best guarding like small guards. And then wasn't the best really like if you posted him deep. I mean, he's a strong kid, 6'6", 210, strong kid. But then it's like you watch him play against like a wing who's doing stuff off the bounce and he's even he's better. And so it's there's an avenue for him to to be even more effective defensively at this level, as crazy as that sounds. But there's still a lot of work to be had as well with Fletch getting with these guys, getting used to playing at this level. So I'm really, really curious to see how how he fares. But I think at a base level, it's a, it's a very, very solid addition. What do you make of them just like prioritizing it and getting it done? Because right, obviously it's a complimentary piece. This is not like the, the yeah. star piece they're going to add. So what do you make? Like they just really liked his game, obviously. Yeah, and I think some of the things that you think about with a Marcus Damask and with Harmon and with these guys that you've – Gary A., these guys that you bring in, I think you start to realize, like, hey, when we get good guys, like good guys, good character guys, high character guys first and foremost, we give ourselves a chance, hmm. right? Because then you don't have cancers. You don't have guys that are blocking your progress. And and then, it like, you can build, and that process is expedited. So you prioritize a guy in Jake that – Yes, can shoot it. Yes, knows how to play. But all the little intangible things that you hear from from different places of like obsessed with the game, super coachable. And then even when I'm watching film on him, little stuff that you notice where, hey, he's a freshman, but he when he starts the game, he's the last guy to get subbed out at like the 12 minute mark. And I've just played on teams before where when you're that guy, there's a lot of trust, inherent trust on both sides of the floor from your coaching staff. And I think all of that plays because you're trying to, in this crazy time of portal NIL, find guys that can be keepers of your culture. Mm -hmm. And I think he fits that bill and I'm excited to see him grow with the program. So last year Underwood built a roster to kind of maximize Shannon and Hawkins. Not that he knew those guys for sure were coming back when he added Harmon, Damask and Gary, A, but there are not many core pieces coming back here, Mike. So how does this offseason plan, do you think, differ, if at, if at all, uh, from last year? I just – I think you have a better foundation to build off of this year. Mm. Uh, I think they found something offensively that you can market, right? Like there are 
the way that they played top five, finishing the season top five in offensive efficiency, touching one super late in the season in the in the Sweet Sixteen, you're the number one team offensively in, or number one offensive efficiency in the country. And now you have things that you can speak to. Now you have ways in which you use DeMarcus DeMask, ways in which you use a Terrence Shannon that you can then pitch, right? Because when you're pitching like spread, it's hard. Like it's it's hard to have a guy and sit down and pitch and be like, you are going to come off these dribble handoffs. And, and, you know, it's, there's, you've seen, I think, and then for transfers as well, look at what Terrence Shannon was able to do, mm-hmm. Right. Look at what Marcus Damask was able to do. And all of that is just it's, I would add Matthew Meyer and Alfonso Plummer, all Big Ten players, right? Plummer and yeah, all, all those guys as well. I mean, and then the other thing that I'll mention too is that, you know, from from things that you hear, like there is genuine interest in Illinois. Like, and, and I say that and people are like, Well, of course, you know, it's a great program, but but to be able to to come out of an elite eight and have players knocking at your door like you would want to be you'd rather be in a position to turn guys away than have to like overextend yourself to try to pull guys in like that's recruiting that's how recruiting should work um and and it sounds like they have that right now but the other thing that i'll i'll touch on and the last thing that i'll touch on um or you know really a couple things because there's a lot here is when you go and you advance in an elite eight to an elite eight and you go into the NCAA tournament and there's more media presence, there's more national media, you know, Field of 68 and um, CBS and, you know, you name it, you get, a, you get a peek behind the curtain of what the culture's like. And I think that's a big, big selling point. And I'm not just talking about like the water guns, right? I'm talking about when you have these guys and these, these this, is, this is the tournament where more stuff gets aggregated out of press conferences, mm-hmm. things that guys say. And when Marcus Damask is saying like, Man, you know, and I get what he was saying, right? Brad gets this rep for being like a, you know, a hard ass and this and that. But, you know, he's really uh, called him soft. And and I, I think it. what he meant is that and what Brad's always been is just kind of like a, a player's coach. And even Brad touched on it where it's like, hey, we don't want winning to be just like a relief. We want to celebrate it. And, I, and that, I'm telling you, like 18 to 22 year old kids that watch that and see that they want to go there. Like they want to gravitate towards that stuff because last offseason – all you saw floating around was was the clip from Northwestern of Brad berating everybody. Mm-hmm. And that tends to be like, well, you know, can you coach this way? But like to me, that's just a like it's a bunch of bullshit, is what it is. Because you see this year, when you have guys that buy in, like this is a coach that's willing to foster that and willing to, you know, help build that, like build guys up. We'll get to some of these transfer targets. But some guys need to be able to just come in and be free and play and have fun with it. And I think that's that's a big thing that we've seen over the course of the season. As I really zoom out of this year, like I look at Brad and how he evolved here, Mike. One, he went and got his guys. He went and got old guys, but he went and got his guys. Um, and Domas, Gary A, Harm, guys that you just knew you didn't have to worry too much about, could could help with that coach, but also really good basketball players. Um but I asked him after the, the UConn game, I said, what did you learn from your team this year? And he said, to enjoy it, to like enjoy the ride, let them like have fun. And I think one, he had more fun with these guys because yeah. one, they won to, they, they were more his kind of players. So I just, I thought Brad continues to evolve uh, yeah. as a coach. And I just thought he had his fingerprints all over this year, but I th- also thought these players kind of, changed him again and let him enjoy this just with the way they approach things and the way they played. Yeah. I mean, it felt like for a couple years there, it was like, you're trying to find a specific archetype mm-hmm. of player. It's like lost to Houston, need length, need size. And then you just, I think this year, you know, it felt like him going more almost back to his roots a little bit. Like you get a Damask who is somewhat reminiscent of like a Thomas walk up when he had his success at Stephen F Austin and, and, and then you just you focus on high character guys that want to win. And then you kind of realize, like, man, this gives us a chance. Like, we'll always have a chance because these guys are coachable. We'll always have a chance because when we have a bad game, it's the reason why they didn't lose two in a row this year. Because guys can just turn the page because they're coachable, because they're not about all these other things. You know, the outside distractions bother them. And you have to have high character and you have to be mature 
to do that. And so that, and that doesn't just come from grad transfers, right? I think sometimes it shows itself that way. And you can certainly recruit that way and, and bring guys in like that. But now you're seeing it, I think, permeate in different ways with like an Amani Hansberry and with, with, you know, like Dre, I think Dre was, was that type of guy towards the end of the season. Um, you know, we'll, see Davis, we'll see what happens with Luke Goody, but he's certainly that kind of guy. Goody's that type of guy as well, where, you know, that's, that's a great point. And so, yeah, I mean, that is in this era, like getting back to the basics where a lot of these teams who are just going to like do talent grabs, you're, I'm telling you, man, like you're not guaranteed to do anything of substance, no matter how great on paper your team is. So, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's been the shift is like, hey, this is going to help us win games. And shoot, you know what? We're going to enjoy coaching a little more <laughs> because, you know, we have guys that are bought in and just and want to win and want to kind of run this thing themselves, too. So I think all that matters, man. Yeah. All right, Mike, uh, let's do a quick ranking of the offseason needs. I mean, there's almost every position here on the board uh, as you're losing, I think, seven of your top eight scores uh, from this year, at least six of the top seven. Uh, so what would be your number one need for this team in the offseason? I mean, I think, a, you know, a lead guard, right? I think that would be one. I think beyond that, you had a lot of success with wings, Right. A stretch big would probably be third and fourth would be, you know, added guard depth. Um, you know, we'll see. I, I just, you know, it's interesting when you watch. And I'm not saying you can go out in the portal and get a Donovan Klingon. That's just insane. But when you do have a rim protector, like if you can find a balance between and this is. This sounds insane, me saying this, but like finding a balance between rim protector and a guy that has enough skill to be able to play some five out to play some, you know, some of the way in which they played last year. Um, because when you have a guy that can protect the rim, it puts less strain on like needing just ace on ball defenders, All right? You can, you can drop down a little bit in that area. If you have a guy that you can funnel these players to, uh, to block shots. So like I, the one That's thing I would fight good. against is like everyone's saying you need a big now because of what Klingon and Edie are doing. It's like those guys are just yeah, stop. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> yeah, that's 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 nuts. Um, th those are like once in God knows how long, or I guess I should say twice in God knows how long um, type of guys. So I'm I'm really curious to see what they do on on the the big side. Um, yeah. Because if if Coleman Hawkins truly is moving on, like that is, it's just we. I mean, we talked about it last year when there's potential for him to move on. That is a, a very versatile piece that you will be missing. Because when you look at like the raw plus minus stuff for the year, I mean, he was far and away their top guy. So that's that's something that that you're going to have to replace in some way, shape, or form. All right, let's uh, wrap up with a couple thoughts on the potential targets that Illinois has been linked to. The star wing uh, that that I think might be the number one need on this team. We've heard him linked to Wisconsin guard A.J. Store. Uh, John L. Davis from FAU just entered the transfer portal. I'd take one of those, Mike. Uh, obviously, that's one of Illinois' top needs here. Um, just so what do you think of some of those targets? Yeah, I mean, I'll start with Store. Um, he's definitely grown on me. I think, you know, Wisconsin was just an odd fit from the beginning with him. He's got to go somewhere that I think allows him to, to play free and be him. And we've actually seen Brad do really well with that and just kind of letting guys play. And Terrence getting, is a heck of a sell to him, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, you he I mean, he's a terrific athlete. We've seen that. His, you know, his three-point percentage dip the last 15 games. I think he was 28% in his last 15 games, but it was kind of funky the way he was getting some of his threes. Um, a lot of them were just crazy deep, like 24 feet plus. And the deeper you go out, the lower those percentages are going to be. So, but the templates there with a guy like with a guy like AJ. And so, you know, landing him would be landing one of the top guys in the portal, just period. And uh, I talk about these teams that go out and just kind of grab talent. There's at least a rapport there with him previously being committed. Um, you know, you, you would feel like, you know, some of the ins and outs of, you know, his situation and, uh, yeah, you get the book on him, right? Like, you, you know, the background there. 
Right, right. So, you know, that that's at least you've cut that part out of it. And there's no wondering there because now there's a body of work in college, too. So no, there's no question with with AJ, um, you know, getting him would be would be a massive pickup. Let's go to the guards. Uh, some of the guys who are in the portal already. Toledo's Dante Maddox. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Toledo guards, Illinois. I would expect to pursue again. Uh, Bowling Green's Marcus Hill. Yeah. There's anybody else you want to add to this, Mike, but those two kind of stand out being from uh, the state of Illinois. Yeah, I mean, those two are – I love them both, to be honest. I mean, I hope this isn't a Ray J situation where we're talking about him for the next two months. <laughs> but <clears throat> but with da- I'll start with Dante. I just – he's another guy who – is, is really good shooting off a movement. And this is going to be, I, I wouldn't call this like a hot take, but you land a guy like Dante Maddox. You, I think you have your best off ball or off movement shooter since Alfonso Plummer. Like, I think he's, he's that good of a shooter off a of movement. Um, he's not like a quick twitch guy, but what he, what he lacks in that department, he makes up for with his length. I mean, he's six two, but I, just eye test, he looks like he has like a 6'9 wingspan. That helps him out tremendously defensively. It helps him out finishing around the rim, finishing in traffic. Um, he does have some explosiveness when he gets down and is able to explode off a of two. So I, I just and, – and he just knows how to play. And he's he's has a great body of work shooting the basketball throughout his career, scoring the basketball throughout his career. And and then you you when you kind of – transition over to and Toledo ran a lot of similar concepts as well. So there's that, there's that overlap too. And then with, with Marcus Hill been super productive at, at Bowling Green and, you know, he puts a ton of pressure on the rim. I say like a Terrence Shannon, not, he is not Terrence Shannon, just like AJ store is not Terrence Shannon. Like that's to go back to store simply being like, ah, Terrence replacement. That's insane. That and that's that's I don't think that's fair to either party, to right. be honest. Um, so Marcus is is what I'll say is like he puts pressure on the rim. They gapped him a lot this year, meaning that they really tried to shrink the floor on him, and it did not matter. He still found a way to to find those crevices and get to the rim. Uh he is a guy that is just so slippery in transition and with his finishes. He's really good on the ball defensively, really good on the ball. Um, the late games, they would put him on on the other team's best player, just like a lot like Terrence in, mm-hmm. in a way. And then the last point I'll mention is just he's, he's a really, really good passer. Something that jumps out on film when you watch him is the passes he makes. He's a lefty, passes he makes with his right hand. Mm. I mean, it is like ball screen, no look, rat passes with his right hand. I mean, it's just really high degree of difficulty – passes so both those guys Maddox and Hill you land either of them those are those are really really tremendous pickups yeah both four-star transfers according to 24-7 uh then the stretch big men some names we've heard attached to Illinois Stanford's Maxime Raynaud Yale's Danny Wolf uh he's just visiting Michigan right now but we'll see what happens with Vlad Golden that might impact there and then Evansville's Ben Humrickhouse uh, who's a really interesting player. I was watching some of his film the other day. Uh, but guys who could play the five or four, Rick House, more probably more of a four. What do you think of those possibilities? Yeah, I think I think with the with Raynaud, 7-1, obviously has size. If you watch him at Stanford, they they played through him in a way offensively where they they you know ran a lot of what like Nebraska would run, where they pop mast out to the top of the key. And it's a lot of dribble handoffs and kind of using him as a fulcrum. Um, he was 36% from three, but on, on limited attempts, I mean, he was under two, uh, under two attempts per game, but seven, one, he's, he's a little bit more like slight frame. Uh, so, but, but he moves well for, for a guy that size. So um, I did, I did like him Wolf in-state kid. Right. And, and really is, you really call it his first year at, at Yale. I mean, didn't do much as his freshman year, but had a tremendous year this year. He's 14 a game, 30, almost 35% from three. And when you watched in the NCAA tournament, like against, against Auburn, it's, you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see what type of jump he makes at this level. Cause he's not the quickest guy. He is skilled. You know, he had a positive assist to turnover ratio at seven feet, mm-hmm. which is, which is really impressive. 
But, you know, against a team like Auburn, there were certain times where you could tell, like, the athleticism. And Auburn's Auburn. Auburn's, like, cream of the crop when it comes to the, the athletes that they put on the floor. But, you know, he fouled out of that game, um, wasn't able to stay on the floor. But, you know, I think, again, I just – I put nothing past Adam Fletcher. I just don't. So, you know, I, I – you never know with some of these guys that maybe you think wouldn't fare well defensively or, or don't move as well as you would like. You put them with Fletch, man. Anything's anything's yeah. possible. And then, and then uh, the last the, the guy from Evansville, Rick uh, House. Yeah, I just looked up Rick House. Yeah, he's. I mean, I I would see him as kind of like a Quincy type of replacement. He was forty one percent from three. Um, you know, I think he came from a maybe from a D two. Uh, almost like a almost like a Minix in in a sense, if you will. Uh, obviously, Illini fans remember him, but but Hum Rickhouse is he's six eight, six nine, and just another guy that you, you feel like could play either the four or the five, given the you know given the scenario. So a lot a lot of good options, and they keep they keep filing in by the day. Well, Mike, it's going to be a busy off season, so I know the season's over, but uh, we're not going to be done with you if that's all right. Like, if, if they add some pieces, we can talk about the future of this roster because, man, there's no off season with college basketball. No, I agree, man. And the last last point I'll make too, because I I've been wanting to make this point for yeah the last two seasons, but I didn't want to make I didn't want to say it because I didn't want to I didn't want to like j- throw a jinx out there in the middle of the season. But once again, and he would not enjoy me saying this because he likes to kind of work behind the scenes and not get the limelight. That's just the type of guy he is. But Adam Fletcher, I I just, now that Terrence is moving on, you think about all the injuries that he had at Texas Tech. Okay. The back stuff, some, you know, he had some knee stuff. He had some ankle stuff. I mean, you name it. I mean, I I think he missed games obviously because of the suspension, but concussion. It's like the only thing. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, like what this guy has been able to do, man. I mean, ask had a foot, then that never cropped up here at Illinois. Did did Quincy have anything? I can't remember, but like, no, like they haven't had many injury issues here besides the concussion stuff the last couple of years. Right. And I, and that is, that's a tribute to him, man. And again, probably wouldn't like me (laughs) saying this, but he's just, he's the best at what he does. And I think as, and I, it's, it's good going off of the portal talk because we can talk about facilities and we can talk about culture and we can talk about offensive system and all that. And and this staff and Brad Underwood and all Adam Fletcher is a big piece of this. Dane shouted him out in his message that he was entering the portal. Dane has, I mean, yeah, Dane's going to make, Dane's going to make a lot of money. He is. And Adam Fletcher is a big, a big reason for that. Dane obviously puts in the work and Fletcher would tell you like, Hey man, it's, it's, it's the kids, it's the guys, but I lived it, man. I, he was, I was with him for one year and it was, I've never seen anything like that. And I know it's only gotten, he's only gotten better. What makes him so good? One, he played. Yeah. So there's just like, the, like there's a natural understanding of the game and the wear and tear. And, and, and he's just obsessed with like, almost like the analytical side of strength training and nutrition that was the biggest difference when when he came in there. How he overhauled everything us for us from us for us in the and like from a nutrition standpoint, what we were eating. That dude that has stuck with me today. Mm-hmm. I just turned thirty, and I think about the things that Fletch instilled in me in the one season I was with him. Like when I go and eat, I'm still like, nope, nope. If it's white, nope. <laughs> like it's like that little stuff that just gets ingrained in you. And you talk about like what basketball can do for you, but nutrition and weightlifting and strength training and staying active, like that stuff is like yep. lifelong stuff. And and he, I know he set me up for that. So, you know, it's, he's one of the, the best weapons in, in college basketball, man. He's incredible. Michael Tupp, you're the goods. We'll catch up as the off season continues, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate you.